now. Cool. Okay, welcome everybody. We've got a very special guest today, which I'm really excited about. This is um, Cheryl Tukiyama, and she is a nutritionist who specializes in weight loss and emotional eating. So our topic for today is about emotional eating. So welcome, Cheryl. Really Hello. excited to be here. Do you want to tell everyone just a little bit about who you are and your journey to where you are now? Yes, hi, look, so nice to meet you too, and thank you so much for having me here today. Yeah, so I've been working as a nutritionist now. I started my career about 10 years ago. Um, I'm now 45, so I hit my 30s and I was doing a corporate career at that time, and then I went through the baby phase and I decided I was in the career with my always nutrition and especially weight loss. At that point for me, it was about weight management. And my love and passion for nutrition has come from my own journey. I was never overweight as a child, but in my teens, particularly my late teens, I went through a grief. Unfortunately, my best friend passed away and I really turned to food about the same time when I started university. And I gained a lot of weight quickly to the point where when I was, I think, 19, my weight had gone above 90 kilos. And so I was at that weight for a while and very unhappy. Although on the outside, I was always the same person, but on the inside, I still like what was in me. And just how I was dealing with turning to food, which was quite a new thing for me. I'd always loved food, but it had never taken on that role in my life like it did at that time. So then I moved overseas and started exercising and was able to lose weight, which was a wonderful experience. But what I, what I found into my early 20s was that while I could lose weight, I couldn't keep it off. The weight was still coming up. It was just creeping up. And I thought, well, I didn't really know anything about nutrition. So I started to see a nutritionist back in the day. And she told me all about the low carb way of eating. And I, I started seeing her and I got a food plan. And that was the absolute key to me learning then how to eat properly so I could maintain my weight. So I never saw a nutritionist to lose weight, but in my process of getting understanding nutrition, I've now worked out how to you know maintain it. So I've now kept off the original 30 kilos that I lost, I've kept off for 23 years now. And along the way, I also gained and lost 40 kilos of baby weight. Yeah. So it's really been my absolute passion of eating this way and also the tools. And that's the key. The tools of knowing not just what to eat, but having the accountability and the tools to actually stay on track and maintain the weight loss. So that's really been a lot of the work that I've done and a lot of the work that I now do with clients now that I am a nutritionist myself. Yeah, it's awesome. How much of that the weight gain do you think comes from people using food to help with emotions? In an earlier age, I would say probably about a hundred percent, because you know, as we all know, as we get older, weight gain can be attributed to definitely more hormonal issues, especially. So people could be eating the same thing. But they're finding that, oh my goodness, I'm gaining weight and I've never had a weight problem before. I, so I think as we age, there are definitely some real physical reasons that are causing it. However, at that younger age, you would have to argue that for most people, unless they have a health challenge going on, I'd say emotionally eating is probably quite a big reason of why people are gaining weight at an early age. And, and how, how would you define emotional eating? So a lot of people will say, oh, I don't eat emotionally. And, and actually, they're, eating, they're not eating in a mindful way, so they don't actually realise that sometimes they're eating when they're not actually hungry. So how, how would you define it? The way that I define it is actually very simple. And I always ask that to my clients too when they're coming to see me for weight loss. I'll say, are you an emotional eater? And a lot of the time, people will say, oh, no, I don't think so, not really. And then I'll say, well, do you eat for, Do you eat when you're not hungry mm -hmm. ever? Oh, yep. Well, that's emotional eating. So my definition of emotional eating is you eating any time that you're not actually physically hungry. And that really means you're eating for another reason. 
And that's what we need to get to the core of. What is it that you're feeling? What are, what are the, these emotions that are driving you to put food in your mouth when you're actually not physically hungry? And I would say it's actually a really high incidence of people who do this. So it's not necessarily just mindless. It's also just that accepting that, you know what, we actually shouldn't be eating unless we're actually hungry. Yet food has become a much bigger part in our lives for lots of reasons. And that's why a lot of people are having problems with eating because they're turning to food to try and meet other needs in their life. How much of that do you think stems from our childhood and the way we were brought up around food? And how much of that do you think is something that's just happened as, as we've, become, we've become adults? I would say that probably for a lot of people, they may link it back to childhood. I mean, if you go back right to when we're babies, what happens when we cry? Mm -hmm. Often we get given food and not just any food, but something quite nice and sweet like milk, you know? So even right from those very early days, there are, you can start to get off of food. I think you can see with some children that pattern of wanting to deal with hurt, frustration, and you food is the solution. I know I've seen it even a little bit in my own children, to be honest, but certainly amongst others as well, that people are turning to food to try and comfort themselves. But it's so interesting with what I see in dealing with such a wide group of people. You'll also see just as many people. When we were growing up, three meals and, you know, mum made a lot of our food. Um, but for me, it really was triggered more by an incident that happened that really that love of food came in a real comfort. So I would say there are certainly some children or some people who would identify right from a young age that they got a lot of pleasure or need other people it's happened more later in life and it could also come about when you have children when you go through these tr quite big changes in your life as a woman whereas in the past you've never had an issue with food or but when we experience great emotion through a trauma or through a whole change in circumstance that's when all of a sudden food and especially sweet food can start filling that role and all of a sudden we are becoming more of an emotional eater because our life's more emotional and perhaps we don't have the tools to, to deal with that. What, yeah. what, what would you recommend then for people, for them to start being, being a bit more aware as to what their patterns are and then do something about what would you recommend that they do? I think the first step, especially if people have a weight problem, is really just sitting back and observing yourself and becoming really aware of why you're eating. Because that is at the core. If you don't understand why you're doing it, it can just continue without you really being aware. So the whole reason I called my business Why Weight Nutrition is because I believe so strongly in the, I guess, the power of the why and trying to understand. I mean, we all know why we want to lose weight, but what we want to drill down to is why we've gained weight in the first place. And emotional eating is such a big part of that. So to me, it's about becoming aware and starting to really observe yourself and looking at, you know, keep keeping a diary, writing down your thoughts. And I mean, one of my favorite journaling prompts is for people who are really getting started on this path of self-awareness. If you're going to eat something and you know you're not hungry, you know, picking up your journal and just, you know, at the top of the page having... Why is it that I'm not hungry and yet I want to put food in my mouth? And looking at that, just stopping and looking at that and trying to work out what am I getting me to want to eat food? Am I? The big ones are usually, in fact, the, probably the biggest one, especially for us women, tiredness. Mm. Tired, lonely, bored it could be joy i'm happy i'm having a good day so i'm going to treat myself even though i'm not hungry you know all of these emotions have the potential to have perhaps 
become connected in some way to us to want to eat. But I think the first step is just doing a little tally, really observing yourself and starting to try to find some links between emotions you're feeling and you turning to food when you're not hungry, because that's the key. There's nothing wrong with being that's what we're meant to do it's all the other times when we're not actually properly hungry and yet we're still wanting to eat that we really want to drill down on especially if we have a weight problem mm, awesome do you say if they if they just don't know why if they can't find their why then they have to keep looking they have to keep sitting there and going deeper, continuing to be, I guess, open-minded to finding out. Because if you can't find out, there has to be a reason. And if you don't know what that is, it's very hard to change something mm -hmm. if you don't know. And I think it might not be obvious at first, but if we can just sit, even sit in that space and just start to observe, even if we don't see it straight away, I do believe that by being open to that process, it will come to you if you're looking. Yeah. I mean, yeah. journaling is certainly a really good one. But even, I mean, if you're meditating, sitting on that, um, it's just, you know, there's that moment where perhaps we're triggered to when we put the food in our mouth. And that can happen quite quickly. A lot of my clients will say, there's no thought. I just do it. Yeah. But there is, if, if you can somehow just prolong that space between when you have that instinct to do it and then you do it, it's this space in the middle. If we can just stop, mm. even if we go on to eat, that's fine, especially in the beginning. But what we want to try and do is use this wonderful space here of self-awareness yeah. to just look for any cues possible of why we're wanting to eat. And also what foods are it, um, you know, what foods is it that we're going to? Because, you know, let's face it, usually it's the carby, sweet, convenient food. So it's also saying, and, you know, this is a key distinction I always use to people when they're wondering, well, is this emotional eating or not? I always say the key thing in your head is when we have that thought, oh, I feel like something. What do I feel like? Mm. You know, when you're standing in front of the cupboard or the fridge, mm, what do I feel like? Oh, it could be that. Oh, no, it's not that. And we do this little game. That's not hunger. You know, because when if we're hungry, we'll eat anything because it's we're hungry and we're you know it's pleasurable. When it's emotional, we're sort of having this little dialogue. And it, the, the key word is anytime you hear yourself say "feel," it's that you're probably experiencing a feeling and you're wanting to meet that feeling with food. You know, so that's a key key way to also help determine whether it's emotional eating or not when you're having that little dialogue going on. Right. I feel, I feel like eating when I'm bored. I <laughs> know that's my biggest thing is boredom. Yes. Or just to, you know, to get you through the next hour or something. Just yes. Have something that's a nibble. Yeah, absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with that either. If you're doing it occasionally and it's not causing a problem, well, that's okay. There's far worse things you could do. I mean, really, this is when it becomes, I guess, a habitual thing that's causing weight gain that's causing you symptoms you're not happy with you know that's when it's really time to take action it's perfectly acceptable that we're all going to have days sometimes where we just you know do a little bit of emotional eating that's fine that's just being human but I think in, in my case especially when people have got a lot of weight to lose it has become you know quite a serious problem I know in my case I gained about 18 kilos in a year so, yeah, that was a lot of emotional eating going on and it, it didn't suit my body, that's for sure. I gained weight really fast. Mm. How would you, do, what, what would you say the difference between craving is and emotional eating? So if you're kind of you're craving something salty as opposed to I feel like, you know, I feel like a piece of chocolate or I feel like some nuts or I feel like baked chippies, sometimes we might crave a taste. I think, yeah, I think that the real distinction is you can have a craving and actually be hungry. So that's quite a difference. I think with emotional eating, you've really got to acknowledge, is this out of what I call stomach hunger? Am I truly hungry, hungry now or am I head hungry? Yeah. It's really in my head. And a lot of the craving, I think, is probably more aligned with head hunger because again, when you're truly hungry, 
you want to eat anything and you might particularly feel like something but real hunger is so different from either normally craving or emotional eating so i would say the real distinction is just you know checking in with yourself and saying well am i truly hungry you know and if you are craving particularly sweet because your body wants the fastest energy possible and that's sugar mm. you know craving for salt can be can be a sign of maybe you're deficient in magnesium or you know maybe you're dehydrated all that i mean they're all your cravings are normally a sign that something's not quite um you know balanced but i would say is always just checking in with your real hunger to know whether it's you know a genuine need or whether it is more emotional well, that's interesting because I often eat, I often eat when I'm not actually physically hungry. I just eat because it's lunchtime and you're supposed to eat. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I will, yeah, I will often, yeah, like, you know, obviously when I'm hungry, I'm hungry. But, um, yeah, like, so for today, today, for example, I came home and had lunch, but I wasn't actually hungry. But I just thought I'll eat now before mm. I do this and that the other. Um, yeah, I mean, I, and I had something perfectly healthy, but I but often. Um, so would you say that you should like kind of generally, or is that only for people who are kind of wanting to lose weight, or you should generally rule of thumb you should just eat when you most of the time um, when you're actually hungry, and then there's sometimes where we just want a bit of chocolate and we you know yeah have, so. Just kind of like, would you say wait until you're hungry or what would you? I would say that, yeah, yeah, definitely as adults, you know, we're such creatures of our schedule, aren't we? And, you know, we have this time allocated for lunch. So that's when we've got to eat. So obviously for some people, especially during the week, that's just the way it has to be. We don't all have the luxury of a flexible timetable. We can just wait. And of course, the risk is too, if you don't have your meal when you have that time and you get too hungry, well, we all know what happens then, don't we? It can be game on or you get really low blood sugars and feel a bit shaky. So I'll tell you the other thing you want to consider, though, is gut health. So weight aside, there's definitely evidence that shows that, you know, when you're physically hungry, your body digests the food better as well everything works better because your body's ready to receive the food yeah if yeah. you're eating and you're not in that hungry state chances are your gut won't be processing the food as well your digestion won't be as good your assimilation of nutrients especially if you've rushed that meal so in a bigger picture of health it's more than just weight that we need to think about of who we are as eaters and again, it doesn't matter if it's a couple of days a week where we're doing that because we've just got a super busy day. That's fine. But I think yeah. overall, being in tune with your hunger as often as you possibly can, is just a really good thing to do. And not just for weight, but definitely for your gut as well. Yeah. Um, just because, yeah, then everything's going to work a bit better. Now, when you're younger, it's, it's different because your gut is healthier, to be honest when you're younger, your whole gut microbiome is a bit more robust. You haven't been maybe so quite damaged from life like we have as we, have as we get older, but every year past 35, in addition to the hormones change, your microbiome starts deteriorating. So your digestion and everything's gonna be impacted by that. So these things do become more important. As always, I always say to people, look, if what you're doing works for you, if you, sit in front of me and say, well, Cheryl, I never eat when I'm hungry, but you know what? I'm fine. I'm happy with my weight. My, I would say to that person, brilliant, keep doing what you're doing. You know, you're the world's expert in you. There are no, there's no one who knows more about you than you. Yeah. That is my absolute core belief. However, if you're experiencing any, weight challenge, energy challenge, digestive. If there's any of that going on, then I would certainly look at when you're eating as, as, a, as something you can improve. And what's cool about that is we don't always have to fuss around what we eat. You know, I mean, obviously there's such a big dialogue about what we eat. My goodness. Mm. You know, and it's changing every week, isn't it? That's in, that's bad, that's good. Yeah. I actually think as we age especially and 
want to find something that's easy, there's far more power in playing around with when we eat than possibly even what we're eating. I mean, of course, the what is important, but I think when we eat and how we eat is even more important, especially as we age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree. And yeah. I was just thinking, like with Andrew saying that, when I used to be a primary school teacher, and I've, I've had clients who are teachers, and you have the morning tea and afternoon tea, and, and like your eating is scheduled to the point where you're almost eating every hour and a half. Yes. And I don't think that's necessarily good for us. And I know people that that people will bring in cakes and they'll share cakes, and I know people who work in corporate, and they don't they don't feel they can say no because they don't want to hurt people's feelings. So what would you say to those people about not not feeling like you have to eat when you don't want to just because it's expected and it's part of the schedule? Absolutely. And that is so such a common thing I hear. And what I say is, look, what you choose to eat is your most intimate form of self-care. It is the epitome of you putting yourself first because you're Every time they day, so you know, working with food is very important. You have to honor it and put yourself first. So if someone's offering you cake and you know, particularly if you've got a challenge with weight, that cake is not a good option for you, by you saying, look, no, thank you, you don't need to give an excuse. You're what you're doing is putting yourself first. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do that, then you're always going to be at the bottom of the list and you're not going to achieve your goal or have great health because it's not just at work, is it? Mm -hmm. It's also that weekend when you go to someone's house for dinner. It's when your mum's made you something. I mean, this is a, a fundamental shift you need that actually you need to put yourself first and that is expressed in what you eat. So... There's, we don't, as women, and I, I find myself doing it too, we don't have to give an excuse. We don't have to say why. If you need an excuse, things like, oh, sorry, I'm actually full. That works quite well. Or um, I'm allergic. If it's someone you don't know, you can always say, oh, yeah, no, flour doesn't agree with me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can always make up an excuse, and there's nothing wrong with that. If that makes you feel better, but really, the key is that our, our big results are determined by those daily actions that we do. And if you're in a workplace where food is being offered, it's even more important that you stay true to yourself and stick with what works for you. Because when I say your life depends on it, I think that it really does. It really does. Mm -hmm. Food is so important. And eating calorific, high sugary, flowery things has a big price to pay, especially if you're someone who struggles with weight, because we just can't get away with it at our age. Yeah. No. You isn't know? It sad that we have to do that, though. Like, isn't it sad that we have to, we would have to make it, make an, make up a lie as to why we don't want to eat that cake? It's the same with alcohol. Mm. Yeah. Well, people, people look at you really weird. Like, yes. you don't want to drink or you don't want to eat the cake. You must be unwell. Oh, one piece of cake's not going to hurt you, you yeah. know. <laughs> exactly. One piece hurt you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, it comes down to that thing of just being strong and confident in yourself and putting yourself first. Yeah. And I also say to, you know, if someone's going to judge me, well, that's none of my business. I can't change what they think about me. The only person I can control is me. I can't control what, what how they're going to react. It's really none of my business, but I certainly can control me. And I know that when I put the effort into the only thing I can control, i.e. myself, I get the results. And, you know, and I, I keep myself at the, you know, in charge and in top. And again, when you're prepared to do that with food and alcohol, you're prepared to do it in other areas of your life. And then you're just such a happier person all around. Um, yeah, and alcohol is a big one because I don't drink. I gave up alcohol when I hit 40 purely for vanity reasons because I realized that after a couple of wines, I just gained weight and I was sick of it. And I thought, actually, you know, hormonally as well, I thought, no, I'm, it just doesn't serve me. As much as I enjoy a good bubbles, yeah. I realized that no. So believe me, I'm, I know exactly what you mean. I get the, the, the looks and people make comments. Yeah. But I, I just think, too bad. Yeah. 
Now, mm. Esther and I don't get invited to parties anymore because we just used to sit in the corner and drink tea. <laughs> yeah. Well, I find, I find when people say to me, why don't you drink, Cheryl? What I usually say is, oh, I, don't, I don't need to. Yeah. That tends to, that, that will get people a bit, oh, okay. I, I mean, I don't always say that, but I mean, I just say, I don't want to. But it is, it, people struggle with that. But you know what? That's their problem. Yeah. You know? We've yeah. got to be strong women and put ourselves first. And I always think when I say no to something, I mean, don't get me wrong, in my in the day I love I love cakes. You don't get to be 90 kilos without loving certain yeah. foods. I mean, of course, especially my mum's baking, I love it. Yeah. So yeah, there are times where we have to say no and it, it can wear you down. But what I always think is by me saying no, what am I saying yes to? And the truth is I'm saying no to you, but in my head, I'm saying yes to my goal, my energy, my health my food plan, my loose pants. So I think of all the things I'm saying yes to, and then that, that, that decision of me saying no is just so powerful. I mean, I don't say that out loud, but in my head, I'm giving myself a high five, like, awesome. You guys drink the bubbly, but there's a part of me that would like to, but a much bigger part of me can't wait to wake up in the morning with awesome energy and go and work out, you know? So I just really think, and that's what I say to clients, think about what you're saying yes to. I because actually, that. you know, if you say yes to a piece of cake that you don't even want and then you sit there eating it, you're just punching yourself in the face. Yeah. But in saying that, and, and consciously though, if you want the damn cake and you think, yeah, I want that cake and I'm going to, then enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. Take it, Get an event. put on the jug. Put some cream on it. Get your spoon and enjoy it mindfully because there's nothing wrong with cake. Yeah. Cake's not the problem, you know. It's it's mindless versus, you know, that unconscious, unconscious, which I'm sure is what you would talk about a lot. Mm. You know, there's nothing wrong with doing that occasionally. It's just that obviously if weight is a challenge, you don't want to do it too often because it's yeah. just not the best choice, you know. And I guess also if you're eat, if you're eating that cake slowly and mindfully, you get to the point where you think, okay, I've had five mouths, I don't actually need to eat the whole lot because I've I've enjoyed what I've had, and that's yeah. it. And most of the time, we're just trying to replicate the first mouthful, which is yum. But then the fifth mouthful is not as good as the first, and we're trying to get that back. So I think if you eat mindfully, you're like, no, I'm done. I'm happy now. I don't need to eat anymore. Mm. Absolutely, and that's a whole skill in itself. I mean, when you think about eating, there are so many, I guess, skills involved, you know, being mindful in the first place, being aware of your choice, how we eat, you know, like you've just said too, if I got most of my clients in a room quickly, mm -hmm. I can guarantee you 95% of hands will go up. Mm -hmm. Just about a lot of people who have a weight problem are fast eaters. Mm -hmm. And it's that same thing. By the time we've registered, we're full. We've already nearly finished the cake and, oh, well, now I feel really full. So slowing down. I mean, I've got a whole worksheet. I've got clients who I make, or I politely suggest, they sit with a timer for two weeks between appointments. I make them time every meal and then they come and we look and look at, you know, the timings of their meal. So there's so many elements of eating that come into play with our health and you know can spring up and cause issues from time to time yeah yeah really fascinating i just love it <laughs> there's, there's like there's heaps of tips already within that so yeah. so the number one thing you think that people should do is actually start to observe their own patterns observe the reasons behind their eating and then from there they've got something to work from absolutely absolutely um, in my logo, was, I had the three A's when I first started my business and it's acceptance or awareness, acceptance, action and accountability. So we have to accept where we are and become aware of what we're doing. We take action on it mm -hmm. and we make sure we're accountable to someone. That's the key in my experience. That, that was certainly the key for me. And for me, being aware, I mean, being honest, you know, I'm aware that I'm an emotional eater. 
the truth is I still am. Mm -hmm. I probably always will be. That's me. When I get upset, the truth is even now sometimes I turn to food because that's just what I do. But what I've learned how to do is do it in a way that doesn't impact me. So I, if I need to emotionally eat, I eat the right things and I'm accountable. I see a nutritionist every three weeks and we, we don't talk about food because I don't need to talk about food. I don't need someone to tell me what to eat. I know what to eat. My goodness, I'm a nutritionist myself. But what I love is checking in with someone about life and about all these other things, stress and all the and tiredness and, and making sure that I'm accountable to my actions. That is why I've never regained and you know kept off 70 kilos because I'm accountable to another person in this world who I can talk to about what's going on. And it has nothing to do with food, yeah. very rarely. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Awesome. Mm. And I also encourage people who are emotionally eating, you know, they're often, we think about food, we make it all about the food. Every time I start to think about food, that's a real trigger that something else is going on. And that's one of my prompts. When I start obsessing about food or what am I going to eat, um, I know there's other things going on and that's really key that I will sit down and try some time to journal. I, you've got, we've got to take it away from the food and bringing it back to the emotions of why we're going back to this habit of thinking that food is going to be our solution when we're actually experiencing an emotion. Mm. And some days are better than others. Mm. You know, we all have times where, yep, we just and like I said, I'm still an emotional eater. The difference is it doesn't happen very often anymore. And I normally like when lockdown happened, I <laughs> rang my nutritionist and I said, right, we're going to catch up every week because I know me and I knew that with the extra emotion, I would need a bit of extra accountability. So yeah, that certainly helped me. Yeah, well, lockdown has affected a lot of people. Oh, with this hugely. Yeah, it really is. And yeah. the challenge for an emotional eater right now is that A, there's a lot of emotions and B, unfortunately, there's no end in sight. Mm -hmm. We don't know, you know, we don't know when this is going to happen. We don't know. I mean, we, we're, our, our new normal is changing. Mm -hmm. But in a strange way, that's also quite powerful because we have to now sort our shizzle out. We, we can't just keep doing this because mm -hmm. it's not like the school holidays where you can sort of give yourself a license to eat a bit crazy because it's all over in two weeks. Then I'll get back on track. Mm -hmm. Like for people who are struggling now, it's actually a really important time to step back and say, okay, there's not much going on in my life that I can control, but actually I can control myself. So now maybe is the time to really work on that because it might be the only thing left mm -hmm. that I can control because we can't control much else at the moment. Mm -hmm. So in, in the midst of this chaos, I think it is actually a really great learning opportunity if we are ready to accept that challenge. And I hope lots of people are because my goodness, if you're emotionally eating now, yeah. it could get really messy. Yeah. Mm. that's awesome and if people wanted to reach out to you and know more about what you do or they wanted to work with you how could they do that yes well by all means they could um, look up my website my website is why website why wait nutrition.co.nz and I offer is it weight as in w-e-i-g-h-t yes so why wait nutrition and I offer face-to-face -face appointments and I've also just launched an online weight loss academy. So I do online weight loss coaching. All my resources are now online. I also have some programs that I've put together that people can do without needing to come for an appointment. I've got an eight-week boot camp and a little five-day reset. So yeah, there's a few things there, but otherwise, certainly face-to-face -face is still an option. My office is based in Orewa. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. I've learned lots of yeah. stuff. That was awesome. Really, really oh, appreciate you. your time today, Cheryl. And I know that lots of people are going to get lots of tips and 
and, and things to start thinking about and making changes. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. My pleasure.